The first one I have, I've titled Computer Heist. Ooh, nerds. <laughs> we talked about cybercrime just now a little bit, but a 32-year-old man named Stanley Mark Rifkin was the grandfather of cybercrime, mm -hmm. and he committed the first true crime done by manipulating computers ever. At the time, this was also the largest robbery in U.S. history. Oh, wow. and it happened right here in L.A., the year was 1978, and Rifkin, who is a smooth-talking computer nerd with a love for video chess, mm -hmm. operated a computer consulting firm that he ran out of his apartment in the Valley, and one of his clients was a company that serviced computers at the Security Pacific National Bank. Rifkin would regularly go into the bank's headquarters at 333 Hope Street, which is downtown. Mm -hmm. It's now the Bank of America Center. Okay. He would go in to inspect the computers, and it was known he was friendly with all the company's workers there. The bank's computers were used to transfer funds via wire transfers to any bank account in the country, and they would on average move around $20 billion a week through these computers. Control, alt, rob. Okay. Eventually, Rifkin realized that he could utilize his knowledge of these computers to get to any amount of money transferred to any bank account he wanted. So the only problem was there was a secret code that changed every day that was needed to authorize these transactions, and the only people who knew the code were the workers in the wire transfer room. Also, he could get the money into the account easily enough. The snag was how could he withdraw it without it being traced to him? So he would have to transform all this cash into an untraceable commodity. The second part was easy enough. Rifkin got a fake passport simple, mm -hmm. under the name of Mike Hansen, and used it to open a bank account at the Irving Trust Company in New York under this name. So then he got a very reputable diamond broker to broker a deal for him with a Russian diamond company called Rusalmaz yeah. to sell him 115,000 high-quality diamonds for just over $8 million. So the deal was all set to go. Now Rifkin just had to wire the money from the bank's computers into his bank account Fank account? You said fank. Oh, God. You're Are being... they called fanks now? <laughs> We're going to have to change everything. <laughs> the biggest fank robbery. <laughs> uh, he had to transfer it into his fake account and then into the Russian company's Swiss account, and the diamonds would be his. Now, the only problem was the secret code. So this, it turns out, was also easily solved. <laughs> it was too hard for the workers in the wire transfer room to have to memorize a new code every day. So they would keep it posted on their wall. <laughs> should anybody forget it or should any curious robbers come by that mm -hmm. wanted to find out what it was? So Rifkin found this out. And then October 26th, 1978, since everybody working in the bank knew him, he just talked his way into the wire transfer room under the guise of having to check something out. And he feverishly memorized the code written on the wall. He thanked them and then he walked out. Then he went into the lobby of the building, placed a call from one of their pay phones, and pretending to be an employee of the wire transfer room, he requested a transfer of $10.2 million to the bank account of Mike Hansen, his alter ego. Oh boy. So he gave the day's secret code, and that was that. The diamond deal went through, and Riffin quickly used his fake passport and flew to Zurich and picked up the diamonds. Then he smuggled the diamonds back into the U.S., and he started to sell them off, but he quickly found out that most places weren't interested in buying diamonds. <laughs> so he sold about $12,000 worth in Beverly Hills, but in L.A., that was all he could do. So he flew to Rochester, New York, not part of California, not part of L.A., and he tried to sell the diamonds to an old business associate of his. And meanwhile, the bank had no idea that he had robbed them until eight days after the robbery took place. The FBI called them and said, you know, you have $10.2 million <laughs> missing. And the suspect is probably this guy, Stanley Rifkin, that yeah. works for you. So um, I don't know if the old business associate he was talking to was actually interested in the diamonds. But before he did anything, he saw on the news that Rifkin was wanted in connection to this giant bank heist. So he reported him immediately to the FBI. But Rifkin was already in Carlsbad, also not Los Angeles, staying with a friend. But when he called the old business associate back about the deal, the FBI was listening to the call and they traced it and they went straight to Carlsbad uh, where they found Rifkin hiding in a closet uh, <laughs> and he immediately surrendered. It must and have been the nicest closet. A closet made of diamonds. <laughs> when they found him, he had a plastic bag filled with 19 pounds of Russian diamonds and some of the diamonds were worth $30,000 each. Wow. So he was caught on November 5th, 1978 
just 12 days after he <laughs> transferred all the money into his account. So he was released on bail until his trial, and he had to live with his parents in the meantime. Surprise. Yeah. A computer nerd hanging out with his parents. <laughs> hanging out. Hanging out. <laughs> Police enforced hanging out. <laughs> the best part of the story, though, is after he was released on bail, he wanted to get enough money to pay for his defense, so he decided to use these same tactics he used before to rob the Union Bank of Los Angeles, and he was plotting with some guy to take $50 million from there, but the guy he was plotting with was an undercover FBI oh, agent that man. set him up. So, he sure knows how to pick him. <laughs> so then on February 13th, 1979, he got arrested a second time, five days after he had gotten off on bail. He was sentenced to eight years in prison, but he only served three, and then went on to work running computers at a nonprofit called the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and has since then faded away completely from the public eye. But he remains today... The greatest nerd to ever <laughs> walk the earth. So. How sleazy. How like wonderfully nerdy and sleazy. Yeah, wait till you see a picture of him. Oh boy. He embodies the nerd sleaze. For eight days he was in the closet. Might have been 12 days. <laughs> Stroking his diamonds. On a 12th day of closet time. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> Stanley Rifkin moves in with his parents. <laughs> One childhood bedroom. 